Well, good evening to you. Good to have you in the service tonight. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, it's good to be in your house tonight. We pray that everything that happens in this room, as well as with the children and with youth, bring honor and glory to you. We want to be used of you. I pray that the word spoken here will bring glory to you as we expose what took place in a mission experience. We love you, Father. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your leadership. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. And amen. Some of you are aware, some of you may not be aware, that Vicki and I just returned from a, a trip to the Republic of Moldova. Um, we spent two weeks there uh, between March um, the 14th to the 27th. It was a return trip for us because between the years of 1995 and 2015, um, I led uh, 16 different um, missions teams into the country. Um, and um, we worked in 22 different villages. Um, started going in in 95 when our church in St. Louis uh, had been working in the country of Romania, and then when the perestroika occurred and the Soviet Union fell, then the door opened to go into the country of Moldova, which was the western border of the Soviet Union, and uh, began to do work there in Moldova and did the, the first uh, four trips um, in the capital area and in the north part of the country. And then after those trips, began to see the real need among the Moldovan people. Um, the real need was a, a medical need and a dental need. And so we began to organize um, those teams, dental and medical teams. But we also took uh, a day camp team to work with children. And then in, in successive years, began to take construction team as well as um, a Christian counselor and did evangelism teams who um, shared the gospel with every person who came through our clinics. Um, in those um, 16 trips, numerous people, because the, uh, we're, we're a part of those teams, um, the... Um, majority of the people came out of the First Baptist Church there in Salem, where I served as Minister of Music and Education. But we also invited other people who chose to be a part of those teams uh, to, to, come and be a, uh, to come and be a part of us as well. Our philosophy behind taking teams into Moldova, um, after seeing those needs in the early trips that I saw, was to minister to people's physical needs, but reaching them with their spiritual need as well. And the great physical need had to do with their medical and their, their dental needs. But we wanted to make sure that we shared the gospel with the people who came through those clinics. Um, and so we set out to organize teams around those areas. Um, the Republic of Moldova um, is situated, it's a country about the size of Maryland, a small country that up until the 12th century was a part of the country of Romania. And Stephen the Great enabled them to win their independence. So they are the northernmost province of the old of Romania, um, but they're sandwiched between Romania and the Ukraine. They are on the western border of the Ukraine, but on the northern border of Romania. The population of the country is only about three million people. Um, and the, the country is rolling hills, and um, the soil is the richest soil in the world. It's the Chernozem soil, um, will raise anything. Um, in some of our construction teams in digging post holes, you can't find the bottom of that rich black dirt. Um, and um, like the Ukraine, the Ukraine was known as the breadbasket for the, the Europe, um, Moldova had a, has a rich resource. But because of Soviet domination, they were dominated by the Soviet Union from 1917 till the early 90s. Um, the Soviet Union ravaged the country building many canneries in the country because they could raise every kind of produce and fruit imaginable. And they, they built these canneries to send the food back in to feed Russia. The, the community of Cantemir that we have worked with for the last eight years and the community that we went back to visit to on this trip 
uh, was centered around a uh, cannery where the people were were uh, uh, they were moved there off of their their um, the farms and the pl the property that they owned, and the Soviet Union stripped that from them and then moved them into what you would call inner city high-rise dwellings, and they lived in flats and worked in the cannery. Um, when I mentioned the um, country of Moldova on the western uh, border of the Soviet Union, uh, on one of the early trips, I went down to see the, the, the fence that was constructed along that border, and it was constructed with 12-foot high um, um, poles, and on that was strung barbed wire very close together all the way to the top of that, and I have a piece of that barbed wire from that pole as well as, as the, the uh, gizmos that were used to attach that to that. Pastor there in Cantemir gave each of us that as, as a reminder to continue to pray for, to Moldova. That fence has been long time removed, but the idea was this. They kept people on the, the uh, inside of the Soviet Union and bet on the, 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 between the... The Prut River, which was the actual border for Moldova, and the fence was a 12-foot wide strip of sand that was kept um, uh, smooth at all times such that the guards who guarded that fence could see if there was anyone who, moved, who tried to escape to see their footprints in that sand. Um, Tony, my interpreter, said that um, they were forced to sing a song that there's no greater nation than the Soviet Union and no one lives like we live. Um, of course, that was a lie. Um, and the, the country um, continued to deteriorate under their communist domination. In 1992, when Perestroika came, um, when the Soviet Union fell, they pulled all of their resources back into Russia pulling all the money, the equipment, and everything back away from Moldova, and everything crumbled. So in our early days of going into Moldova, there were no food on the shelves. We had to take all the water that we would drink in a single the trip with us because we could not drink the water from any source there. Um, and the, the conditions were, were so sad. Uh, Crumbling infrastructure on roads, buildings that they, had, that they had started constructing were just left empty, and the people were left without jobs. Um, it's sad that even that continues today, that the unemployment in Moldova is extremely high, and they're continuing to experience um, a migration of their own peoples to, all, to countries all over Europe, all over um, Asia, wherever they can find jobs. And so many have even immigrated to here in the United States, um, to the point that their population within the country continues to decline. Um, we were talking to one of the doctors there. Uh, we had dinner with him on the last Saturday that we were there in the country. Um, so uh, the problem has become so bad. In the Cantemir district that we worked in for so long, um, there were at one time 45 elementary schools, and the majority of them have been closed because there are no children. The young families that give birth to children have... have um, um, migrated to all the countries and leaving many of the villages with homes that are, that are empty, properties that have been vacated, and it's become a real problem for Moldova. And that, the anticipation is that it, that will continue. The religion in Moldova is 98% Russian Orthodox. Um, when perestroika came, in fact, under Soviet domination, even the Russian Orthodox Church, churches were bombed. Um, the big cathedral in the capital city was used by the, the Soviets as one of their um, offices. And when perestroika came, um, the, the uh, Orthodox Church took back their facilities, but they resisted everything that was going on with Baptist Union. Um, the Baptist Union work continued under Soviet domination, but under a lot of oppression. And even um, 
in the work that we uh, did in those years were opposed by the Russian Orthodox Church. And many of the villages that we worked in, we were opposed by the priest, uh, the Orthodox priest there, because they did not want any competition for the people in their village. And they did... Um, in one locale where there were new converts and they took them to the local lake, the priest went down to the lake and had to purify the waters that had been desecrated by these new converts and been baptized there, lying to the people about the failure of their crops if they continued to participate. And the pastor at Cantemir, at, in places where they tried to show the Jesus film, would run out of town and rocks thrown at them. Um, and then as they tried to share the gospel after the, the Soviet Union fell. But the Baptist Union has been strong even under Soviet domination. They too had their buildings bulldozed. They had all kinds of oppression, and, but um, they remained strong. And even after the Soviet Union fell, the Baptist Union was so strong that our own IMB pulled out of the country, saying that they, the, the uh, Baptist Union was strong enough that it no longer needed IMB missionaries, and they were left to carry on the work by themselves. Um, the country still experiences extreme poverty. Um, there is a tremendous contrast in what's going on in the capital city in Chisinau, which has over a million people, and what happens in the villages. The villages are still, you still see horse and buggy. You still see hay gathered loosely on wagons and pulled into their, you still see um, animals herded in open fields. Of course, in Soviet domination, all the fences were removed and it was common ground. So herding sheep and cattle and uh, herding geese, if you will, was common and is still common today among the people because they are so poor. The, the, the homes um, were primarily constructed in, in um, the early days of homemade block of clay, of manure, and straw, and make it just like you would think they were made in the days of Egypt, and they would set that in the sun until it, until it um, baked hard, but you had to make sure when you were building a, a, a structure out of that that you had to get it under roof rather quickly or it would deteriorate rapidly. That progressed to making buildings out of calca, Calca is, a, is mined out of the earth. It's nothing but just um, um, deposits of calcium. And uh, it was cut just like you would uh, cutting a tree with a chainsaw. They cut that calca with chainsaws and mined it. A lot of houses then began to be built out of that. And today, some concrete is being used, but not in the villages because they're so poor. And most of the houses have asbestos roofing on them. Um, you still see people walking everywhere because um, in the village, poverty reigns. In the capital city, we're seeing more cars than we had seen in the past, but that's, that's simply a phenomenon that's going on within the cities. Um, for the first eight years, um, the teams that I led were primarily in the northern part of the country. We worked in Kolobash and Kishino and Kalarash and Fagarin, and um, we did two in the southern part of the country in Kahul and Kranaviki. But the last eight teams that we took in were with the Cantemir Baptist Church. Cantemir is in the southern part of the country. And um, the Cantemir Baptist Church became our host. Um, my first thought about taking teams into Moldova is that the teams need to be spread over numerous villages to try to minister to the needs of many people. But I soon learned that every year we had to build new relationships with a new pastor and a new congregation. And what I, what I learned from the Cantemir group is that once we built the relationship with them in the first and the second year, we could build on that year after year after year and then take the teams to villages around Cantemir. And so for the last eight years, that's exactly what we did. And we worked in the villages of Kania, Eperen, Tachand, Hertop, Tarklia, Plop, Kerpest, um, Purimbest, Kuchalia, and Tsagunka. So the host church, 
Cantomere Baptist Church, they would host us. We lived with uh, families in their homes, in their dwellings, ate at their table. But during the daytime, we then would take the bus and be transported to the villages. And there we would do um, the um, clinics as well as the day camps and the other teams. The living conditions, the pastor um, Vladimir and Virginia Bonchev have pastored the Cantomere Baptist Church, um, I guess, for 40 years or more, and he has never, ever been salaried. Never. His wife operated a music school of about 200 students there in Cantomere, and she made $40 a month, and that's what they lived on and subsistence living. They lived in a flat, just like the rest of the people in Cantomere, and Vicky and I stayed with them every year that we took teams to Cantomere. In fact, we stayed with them when we went back this trip. They live in a three-room apartment, a kitchen, a living room, and a bedroom, and they raised two boys in one bedroom. And we, all the years that we've stayed with them, we slept on a futon in their living room. Very meager conditions, um, but we ate at their table, and once we had five people in the kitchen around their table, the kitchen was maxed out. Um, um, many of our team members weren't in the flats. They stayed in Kenia or in Eperin, in dilapidated housing, um, one of our teams, they didn't even have running water in the house. They showered with buckets poured over their head out behind the house. Um, in fact, our early teams, are, and even Vicki made 12 of those trips with me, and in the early years when Vicki was with me, the water was only on in certain two hours in the morning, two hours at night, and in the, in, in, electricity was even limited in those days. Thank goodness that has changed. And um, even in the flats, we're noticing some change in the even the bathroom and the shower facilities. Um, the foods that we eat in Moldova, Vicki and I love the foods. They're not real spicy in any way. Soup is always served first. Borscht always is, a, is sometimes served. Of course, it's a, it's a beet. Uh, if it's red, it's got beets in it, it's borscht. Lots of vegetables, lots of fruit, uh, pasta, very little meat that can afford the meat. Um, and they serve a drink called kumput. Um, it's a fruit, boiled fruit drink. Um, and the fruit drink ha has the fruit in the bottom of it. Um, and it's delicious. And because it's boiled, we could drink that. We still cannot drink their, um, uh, their water still to this day. But you can buy bottled water, which we couldn't find for years. Um, we were invited back for the two weeks that we were there by the Bonchev family, and it was sort of a reunion trip because they took us back to, we went, got into 13 of the villages of the 22 that we had worked in just to see what had happened. Um, it's been eight and a half years um, since we'd been there. I retired in 16, and our last trip was in 2015. So it was a, sort of a review as to see what God has done in those places where we had taken the teams. Let me give you some idea. The, the dental team in the early days, we didn't, being inexperienced, the dentist we took along simply had them sit in a chair, and he bent over for a week trying to see in mouths. We learned quickly that the Christian Dental Association had cardboard dental chairs that we could assemble. And we, every year we would take more and more dental equipment in and leave it there. And every year then we would have it for use. Um, to give you some idea of the, the dental condition of the people, many of them have, had never seen a dentist, could not afford to go to a dentist. They couldn't even afford toothpaste or a toothbrush because feeding your family is the top priority. And if you don't have the funds for toothpaste or toothbrush, you can imagine what their mouth was like. In Fagarin, we had a lady who came to us, 
She was from Capriana, which was across the mountain, and she came with this story. She said, I've prayed and prayed and prayed for God to send somebody to help me with my teeth. And she said, I heard this morning that there was a dental team. She said, I've walked across the mountain. And when the doctor looked in her mouth, she had pulled every tooth in her head, but left the roots in every one of the places. He said, I would have sent her to an oral surgeon in the States because she was in such excruciating pain. And he did surgery and removed every one of those roots. And he did it with anesthesia. The people in Moldova who could afford dental work had it done without any anesthesia. And they had a horror of dentals because of the pain that they experienced, and primarily with extracting teeth. You can imagine how, what the pain would have been like. But he, he extracted that woman's root tips and gave her um, a week's supply of antibiotic. She showed up the next day having taken the entire week's supply of antibiotic in one night. He said it was enough to kill her, but she was so happy that she was pain-free. Many of the people who got up off of the dental chair kissed the doctor's hands because of the, being able to experience the dental work with pain-free. In the dental and the medical clinic, the medical conditions that we saw primarily were tuberculosis, cirrhosis, hepatitis, cancer, heart conditions, and stomach issues. We had a woman get come to our clinic in Fagarin, and when she came up the church steps, all the people waiting for the clinic fled, just disappeared. We didn't know what the problem was. She came in, we registered her, went into the doctor, and the doctor came and said, give me a camera quick. The woman had a hole straight through her chest wall that had been eaten by tuberculosis. All the people in the village knew she had tuberculosis and they didn't want to be around her. That's the reason they fled. But she said, you helped me. You gave me up. There was not a thing the doctor could do to close up that wound. And she was probably going to die from the tuberculosis, but the doctor addressed her need. The concern for us, the doctor simply came out and said, take these vitamin C tabs and open up all the windows. You'd have to stay around it for a length of time in order for you to come down with tuberculosis. But every kind of, of medical need you can imagine. We, used to, we did take a Western doctor with us from Salem the first time, but we learned something in doing that, that using a Western doctor, everything we do in Moldova has to be interpreted. They either speak Romanian in the village or Russian in the major cities. So everything that the doctor would see had to be interpreted, meaning that if you had an excellent interpreter, you got a right diagnosis. But the problem was when an interpreter interprets tuberculosis as bronchitis, you got a problem. So we learned that we no longer needed to take Western doctors through which everything has to be interpreted. And in the Capitol and the Baptist, um, the Jesus Savior Church, they have a clinic there, are numerous doctors and pharmacists. And we employed uh, doctors from that clinic and the pharmacists from there as well. Vicki served as our pharmacist when we were at that Fogger Inn with that doctor. There's no way we can that we could read Russian labels to know what the, the concentration of the solution on anything. So the Western doctor could not, could not figure that out. So we've solved that by making sure we employed a doctor and a pharmacist who didn't have to have anything interpreted. With the dentist, it's a little bit different. All he has to do is to look in the mouth. It does not have to be interpreted. He can see exactly what needs to take place and what needs to be helped. With the day camp team, we operated day camps. It was just like vacation Bible school, but it operated from morning till evening. And numerous children. And by the way, when the, when the village found a, heard that there was a dentist there who did dentistry with no pain, it was impossible to see the number of people who flooded the clinics for the rest of the week. And the other frustrating thing was people who came to the dental clinic, they had multiple things. The doctor said he could spend a day on one mouth and he was having to choose the, 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 each thing that could be done. Somebody needed to be there on a, an annual basis to take care of the needs, the same way with the medical clinic. So many needs that needed to be addressed year round, not just during the week that we were there. 
We had a Christian counselor with us that we, we told the people that we have a counselor and if they wanted to see the counselor in um, Kalarash, um, a professional tennis player came and wanted to see the counselor. And after one session with the counselor, he said this, I will personally employ you and take care of you if you will move here and be my personal counselor. He was an alcoholic and it was ruining his career and he needed the help. The country having no, no social work in, in, of any kind, no counseling of any kind, desperate for that kind of work. And then many people, and you remember I said what our real desire was, was to see in these villages if people with, we would share the gospel with, and in sharing the gospel, many responded to the gospel, and the desire to see in that village a group of people who would desire to study the Bible on a regular basis that eventually would become a church the Cantomere Church, if that would happen, they would send one of their deacons to lead the Bible studies and then become the pastor of those churches. Um, in um, this reunion trip, I, I, several times during the trip, I just wished that I had had all the members of the teams that I had taken over the, the 20 years that we had gone in. I was blessed over and over and over again. At Krihanaviki, where we had, had um, uh, stayed with John Groza, and he had been responsible to go out to Krihanaviki and to be that person to, to start a church. And we worshiped in the yard of that, that uh, family. And one day on going back to Kolobash, he stopped the car and he said, I have a dream. And my dream is on that lot, right there beside the road, that one day we'll have a church. Vicki and I saw that church. I just wept to see the kind of things that God was doing. Not only was there a church, a beautiful edifice, but the guard was there, let us inside, and they have an orchestra of 26 members. And next door was a, a Christian life center with a gymnasium on the upper floor with a children's ministry on the first floor for children after school, feeding them and then helping them with their homework. And John Groza, our host, is still pastoring there. And John Groza is on the, in the legislature in the state capitol. When we were at Purimbesht, when we took the clinics to Purimbesht, the, the local priest tried to force us out of town and tried to get the, the host to, to close his home to us. He, he tried his best with um, the, the, uh, the pastor from Cantemir to resist the work that we were doing. Today, there is a church at Purimbest. And we sat and talked with the pastor and with the, the man whose house was used to start that church. I just, I, I, I rejoiced and I thought, I wish the, the team members who had worked at Purimbest could see what the Lord has done from the efforts that were poured in those early years to the community of Purimbest. When we went to Eparin, at Eparin, there was a family who let us use their family for the, their house for the clinics. And um, the children had to go out in a pasture where the sheep were grazing. And next to it was an old rundown community center. And the, in front of the community center was a concrete slab that had cow piles all over it. And the children's team had to go to that concrete slab between the cow piles to do their artwork that day. We went back. And next to that old rundown community center is the Baptist church in Eparin. And next to the Baptist church, there is a foster care home that's taking care of eight children. I just rejoiced in that. Amen. When we went to um, the church in Kishino, the team we took there did construction. And the church was just beginning its work. And the mayor of the city said, you've got three years to finish the church or we're going to take the property back away from you. Um, today, there is a beautiful church there. The second year that we went and worked with this church, we took a large day camp team and they worked with several day camps, children's groups. The guard to this church, after he showed us the facility, shared this testimony. He said, my daughter... 
heard the gospel in day camp. Our daughter came home and told us what she had learned about Jesus Christ. And my wife and I got saved. And now I'm a guard at this church. And he said, and I'm not the only one. There are other families here whose children heard the gospel in day camps. I, I just wish that I had those, those team members who had spent time with children. And sometimes we can think we're not making an inroad with these kids. They're not listening. They're, but here is children who witnessed to their parents who became a part of a church and are still active there. When we went to um, um, Fagarin, Pastor Peter met us there. Pastor Peter was having a terrible time trying to make an inroad into the community, and he was being resisted there. He was trying to build a house. They were doing damage to his house. They were resisting the work at the church, and he wanted the team to come to minister to the people's physical needs to demonstrate to the fact the fact that we were there interested in loving them and helping them, not only with their physical needs, but with their spiritual needs. And after we left, he shared the testimony. The community has a different outlook totally about our church family because of the work that you did. But he shared another story. He said, after you left, I felt the, the call to do um, work with uh, children with disabilities. And he said, for a year, I said, no, Lord, I can't do that. I'm too busy here at this church. And a year later, they had a Down syndrome child born to them. And he said, now I understand the Lord's call. And he committed himself not only to pastor the church in Fagarin, but to go to Strashen, which was the neighboring town, and establish a ministry to disabled children. And now they have 70 children participating in that with Down syndrome, with autism, with retardation. And, and, and he even had a family member that, that came here to the United States in Minnesota and begged him to come to, the, to Minnesota. And Peter's statement was this, I cannot leave this church and I I cannot leave this ministry to those children. And the second trip that I made into Moldova, Peter was the person who led me from village to village, and we couldn't even speak a word. And the Lord was using that young life then, he wasn't even married or have a family, um, to do marvelous, marvelous work. In Cantemir, there was a man who was the guard at the church by the name of Vasilika. And one of the last trips that Vicky and I made to Cantemir, we visited Vasilika's home. We had built a home for him. You would call him a hunchback. Such a gentle, sweet believer. And um, he had helped us in previous trips, whatever he could do. But on this trip, we went to the home that we had built for him. And he was bedridden. And Dr. Galena went in. We, we had brought some things to present to him as gifts, but Dr. Galena's evaluation was, there's no hope. And all of us were so burdened and began to pray for Vasilika. On this trip, Vasilika is in the worship service with a wife that he's married since we were there and a seven-year-old son. And the story went like this. After we left, there was a doctor in the capital who said, it's a 50-50 chance that I, can, that I can take his case and save his life. And the church began to pray for him. And, and he went through the surgeries. And today you wouldn't even know that there was a problem. And God has done a marvelous work in his life. And he's there still carrying on the work with that church. The church is up against some um, difficult times because of the um, migration of so many of their brightest and best. Most all the interpreters that Vicki and I have ever worked with have all left the country. The young people and the young families are gone. And the work that the Cantomere Church is continuing with an aging population. There were two young families, five children is all they have. The, the people that they, that they find as converts and they're baptizing on a regular basis are having to leave the country because there are no jobs. 
in order to feed families. Many of the parents have left and left kids with their, grand, with their, with their parents so that the grandparents are raising the kids that are left. But um, the population of Moldova is greater beyond its borders than within its borders. So to pray for the Kentomir Church, for them um, it, still being able to carry on their work with that kind of problem that's facing them is a, is a grave problem. And in the problem of um, working with um, their economy is still in shambles. It grieved me to see a, a place that has such rich, deep soil that could raise any kind of crop or produce. In fact, on one of our last trips, we went to a peach orchard, peach trees by the gazillion, and the peaches falling to the ground and rotting because there's no market. They, their, their own government is, um, um, it's, is not providing the marketing system that they need. And it, it, it is, it's, it's dire for all of them. So employment and the population that's, that's leaving is a, is a real problem for the churches in, and, and I heard several of these pastors say, pray that we find committed workers who will help us carry on the work. Um, the last, so the Sunday that we were there, they presented us with a picture of those who were a part of the congregation that day. And also, it was the week that uh, Vicki and I celebrated our birthdays, but Vladimir in Virginia, the host pastor and his wife, also celebrated March birthdays. So the last night, Sunday night that we were there, it was a birthday celebration for all of us. But they gave Vicki and I a bound album of pictures of the work that we had done through the years. I, I just... I just wept when I received that. They, they are such a gracious people, a loving people. Um, they have so little, and they give so much. We were blessed to be back on a reunion trip, and um, when I talked to the uh, church in Salem, um, we're going to go back there and just give them a report because so many of those people invested time, invested finances, invested their talents and abilities, and for them to be able to hear and to reap the, the uh, report about what has taken place as a result of their work have, is a blessing to me and I hope a blessing to them. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you that um, you use people, you use skills and abilities that you've given people. You, you match them, them with the places where around this world there is a need for service. And, and you, you call them into service. And when they're willing to do that, the, the, the people have been willing to share the gospel and to minister to needs. And you've been able to do some miraculous things. And we give you the thanks for that. I thank you, Father, that I was able to even see that and to just be blessed to see that the time and the effort and the work and the finances and the skills and abilities that was poured into those trips for years, to see what is, has is happened as a result of that and to know that your work there continues and how we pray, Father, that even though the work is difficult, that you would bless those pastors, bless those churches as they continue to minister in those communities. We love you, Father. We thank you for your goodness. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray and amen.